Dame Carol Black with us this evening um, to talk to us about equality in the workplace. Um, I'm not going to take the liberty of introducing her. I think she's um, probably the best person to talk about all the great things that she has done in her life. So I will then hand it over and let her get started. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, um, <laughs> I'm really delighted uh, to be here. I'm going to be very brief about uh, uh, my career. Suffice it to say, I'm a physician, uh, professor of rheumatology, um, became president of the Royal College of Physicians um, in the United Kingdom, then president of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. Then my career took a turn, uh, and I became the government's first national director for health and work. Uh, and I've stayed on as a government advisor on health and work, um, particular interest in women in the workplace. Um, and then in 2012, um, became the head of Newnham College, which is a Cambridge college, uh, which is a women's only college. Um, so throughout my career, I've been really interested in women uh, and the development of their careers. Um, I'd be really interested in, in a full discussion today. What I'm going to talk to you about um, a little bit is a bit um, about uh, just, just the equality survey, uh, the, the Fawcett Society um, does at home, and then move on to use as an example Cambridge University, just to give you a feel for still how bad we are at not getting women into STEM subjects and into technology. I will use that as an example. I then want to sort of use medicine as an in-between example because medicine's partly a science and partly an art. Um, and you'll see the slight difference there. Um, I think there are a lot of questions why Cambridge, and by the way, Cambridge is very similar to Oxford in its figures, is as it is. I'd be very interested in some of your um, if you, some of your comments on that, and then move on just to some examples from the Harvard uh, Business School, where it's probably closer uh, to your own experience because it's the business world, and then end up with some more general marks, and, and then I hope we can have uh, uh, an interesting discussion. This was the 2016 Equality Survey. Um, and, uh, I mean, on the whole, things have been improving in the UK. And from this survey, as you can see there, nearly nine in ten men wanted women in their lives to have equality of opportunity um, with men. They thought it might be good for the economy uh, as well. But 62 believed that more needs to be done to achieve um, equality. So, but that was an improvement on where we were before. But I do want to remind us, because we're all remarkably fortunate in this room. Um, this is taken from Alison Wolfe's The XX Factor, 2014. And what she did in that book was remind women who had been as fortunate as the women in this room are, that although we have had the opportunity of a good education uh, and, and good careers, and as she said, you don't any longer have to be an extraordinary woman to have a successful career. Women do very well at school and in, in the initial exams and in some of our universities uh, in their examinations. They're m women are more um, university students than men. Um, and for 15% of women about that, life uh, for those women is in a way more like men, but I want us not to forget that for 85% of women, life remains highly gendered, and many, many women uh, are doing highly uh, unsatisfactory jobs, low-paid jobs, um, and often in the gig economy, um, earning their living from several jobs. And this was just some of the figures uh, from Alison's uh, book. Um, you can see their maids and housekeeping and cleaners, 90% female. Nursing, psychiatry and home health aides, 89% female. Interesting, in the UK, the top of the nursing profession is becoming more male-dominated. It was female dominated, it is now more uh, male dominated. Um, and inequality, certainly in the United Kingdom, 
is growing faster among women than among men um, and more women are indeed um, getting to the top. Well, where's the worst, best, uh, worst place to be um, a, uh, a working woman? I looked very hard to see if you were there, but I couldn't find, uh, um, I couldn't find Singapore um, on this glass ceiling uh, uh, index uh, from, the, um, from the economy. Um, here we are, um, just here. Um, and the uh, gender pay gap in women, in Britain, women earn 16.9% less than men. So they're just some, them some sort of general uh, facts uh, that it might be worth our thinking about. But, but I want to suggest to you that stereotyping starts pretty early. And if you think about it, we do stereotype people. On the whole, um, we think that nurses uh, will be women. Uh, we think that primary school teachers will, on the whole, be women. But when we come to engineers, we tend to think of them as men, airline pilots, uh, train drivers. I asked our train drivers union why we didn't have any women train drivers on our long distance trains in the United Kingdom because I do some work for the rail industry on health and work and they simply told me that women do not drive trains. <laughs> Full stop. Women do not drive trains. I said but they fly aeroplanes. <laughs> that did not move them one inch. And, and the trade union in, for, for the train drivers at home is so strong, we still do not have one single woman driving a long distance uh, train in the UK. So you can see how far uh, we need to go. I hope you would assure me that this is, uh, this is changing. And of course, so many of the world's great chefs are men. Uh, so we tend, and I th still think we do this, we tend to stereotype individuals. This is um, a piece of work that came out of the USA and was reported in The Guardian, so it's only media reporting. Therefore, you, you need to take it with, uh, if you like, uh, you, you know, it, but no, I won't say a pinch of salt because it was reporting a... Uh, uh, a, a proper piece of work, a US study based uh, at New York uh, University, um, and found that unlike boys, girls do not believe that achieving good grades in school is related to innate abilities. And it said that at five, girls are just as likely as boys to associate brilliance with their own gender. But in this particular study, at six, this is less likely for girls than for boys. So are we, are we beginning quite early on um, to start to really gender stereotype early on? This was the OECD report on gender equality in May 2015, and they looked at teenage girls' choice of subjects. Now, I think it would be reasonable to assert that boys and girls at birth uh, their abilities are similar, but it does seem as they go <coughs> through schooling, um, according to the, and the OECD usually do very good and very science-based uh, research, boys are more confident of their abilities to perform, um, and they will tend to go and have a go, and, uh, while girls tend to play safe. And what they reported in, uh, in this gender equality report, that Parents often don't give their children equal um, encouragement. They, uh, it, it's often that the parents, even if their girls are better at science at school than their boys, will tend to expect a son to be more successful in science um, than they would expect um, their daughter. So are we, um, as parents, is there an unconscious bias uh, there and that was one of the messages of this report. And then Dame Athene Donald, she is the professor of experimental physics 
at Cambridge, a great woman advocate for women in stem cell subjects, now the master um, of Cambridge College, uh, Churchill College in Cambridge, which is a college devoted to STEM. They have to take 70% of, of students who will suffer, student suffer uh, studying a STEM subject. But this is what she said uh, in the Times, that, uh, well, if we always give a girl a doll to play with rather than a train, um, then, of course, we're starting, again, to uh, a, a stereotype of, of female. Um, and, uh, uh, and if they're making tea and worrying about their hair, do they really imagine themselves as engineers or chemists? But this, and I did put it in red, because I think this is really quite shocking, and this is, again, uh, British schools, um, that peer pressure, and this is in our state schools, not in our private schools where women do better on the whole in science than in our state schools. Half of mixed sex, it should say state schools, send no girls to do physics at A level. So there's already that if you are in a state school system, um, your chances of being encouraged uh, to do the stem cell subjects are far less than girls at single sex schools, which are nearly all in our private sector, are 2.5 times more likely to study physics. So again, there's something about the type of our school system. Um, and then when it comes to vacation jobs, do we stereotype women and men um, then? And, and um, I think that is worth uh, thinking about. So let me tell you what it looks like in, in Cambridge. Uh, and uh, there are some things here on which I wouldn't mind uh, your views. Um, it would be fair to say equality and diversity are continuing um, issues. It's a great university, has about 12,000 um, staff. It's a mixture, as many of you in this room will know, of, of the old as far as colleges um, are concerned. Um, and that's our college over this side, uh, 1871. Uh, but some wonderful uh, modern uh, uh, buildings as well. So. Our Vice Chancellor, who steps down in three weeks' time, he's retiring. We have a Canadian Vice Chancellor uh, coming. So Boris said, we believe in the dignity of people and their rights to respect and equality of opportunity. And we value the strength that comes from the difference and the positive contribution that diversity brings to our community. And he's been a great advocate provide diversity of every kind in the university. And we have to hope that his successor will, uh, will do um, the same. Um, and as I said, staff, about 11,400. Uh, 11, These are the academics. That's academic related. Then, of course, the more people are employed as assistants and researchers. That's our BME community, by the way, that does include our Chinese um, uh, staff. Um, white British, you can see that, white others. And you can see the staff of the university is uh, uh, fairly split um, between male and female. It's always difficult with, with the, those, that, uh, when we ask people to declare if they have a disability, many people <coughs> may choose not to declare. This is just again looking at some of the highlights um, on staff and this is um, the, the brighter blue are the females, the lighter blue are the men. So this is all staff, so this would include assistants within the departments, um, etc. Um, secretaries, it would, it would include anyone who worked within any of our STEM subjects. Um, so 3,251, 3,770, this is within um, the humanities. Again, uh, you could say not so bad, but now when we come to STEM academics. And 
what I'm going to show you in a moment is just how our women um, do uh, in, as they progress through the university, but they don't have that many role models. And when it comes to the professorial level, we have only 18% of our professors are female, one eight. We have the worst figures of any British university. Um, still, we're, we're improving. I gather that it might be about 20% because a new report was just coming out as, as I came away. Um, and this is in the humanities where you might expect that we might see um, more females. So the actual role model for moving up the ladder in stem cell subjects is not um, great. And you can see here um, the, um, the other uh, the other figures there. Uh, it's been a continual worry to the university um, that we, we have still fewer female academics than uh, men, and they've done a lot of work on unconscious bias, etc. Um, so uh, now if you look at um, the um, undergraduates, of females, 44% of our undergraduate population and then we have both taught postgraduate courses, the MPhils, and we have research postgrads, so they're mainly PhDs, uh, and you can see the number of, um, uh, of women there. But this is now our undergraduates coming into Cambridge to do their first degrees. This time the pale blue is the female, and you can see a considerable difference 36 percent there um, within the humanities it is 58 um, percent but this is the biggest conundrum of all and if you have any any suggested pieces of research that we perhaps could do we've done a lot but they come into to Cambridge with the same examinations from school you there's no you there are grades you have to get and there's no variation there's no exception to the rule. And so for science, it's A level, two A stars and an A minimum. Um, but when it comes to the final exams in Cambridge, I've looked back the last 10 years, but it may go on well beyond that. Um, first class, 32% of men and 23% of females. And that has been a persistence it is the same at Oxford, and yet it's not quite like that at, at any other British university um, to that extent. But the gender attainment gap is similar uh, in STEM as in the humanities. And when it, it, you get to a good degree, so a class two, um, one, uh, actually, then it, it, it is... Um, uh, reversed. Uh, our Chinese students do extremely well um, in, the, uh, in the final tripos and in part one of the tripos. Now that is a problem. It's not such a big problem in some other British universities, but, but it is still the pattern. I'm showing you rather the extreme here. But the real problem is that if we have low females in STEM subjects in the university, then it's a pretty big bottleneck in getting women into technology and into entrepreneurship because we haven't got a pipeline and we don't seem to be getting um, that much better because, of course, you do have to be technology uh, literate uh, and especially in um, computer coding. And yet when women do choose to become entrepreneurs, they can often outperform them, their male uh, peers, and women-led companies often do significantly better um, than average, but there are just not enough role models around, and we just don't have a pipeline that is actually feeding um, this particular industry. And I've talked to this about this quite a lot to Matt Clifford, um, is a very bright young man from Cambridge who went into McKinsey's and then formed his own company, Entrepreneur First, which he sold at great profit um, uh, quite recently. But what Matt said to me, he's quite frustrated by it. 
and said that we just really got to change the culture. This isn't a genetic issue. This is straightforwardly a cultural issue, but it goes back quite a long way and it may well go back um, further than uh, we think. And he says coding should be in our curriculum. Um, coding is okay, whether you're male or female. And he said somehow women seem to think that the tech world is very narrow when it isn't necessarily narrow. And how do we get, um, how do we get the message um, changed? But we do need some really um, significant role models um, to change this. So any thoughts you have um, on this, um, I'd be very grateful for. So that's a little bit about Cambridge. My own career is, is as a medic. Um, and as I said, this is, a, this is a, a specialty where you need a lot of science, increasingly more science, but you do need, you do need some of the humanities. Medicine isn't just about um, the sciences. And I, I'm very happy to say for many years, we've had meritocracy um, in our medical school. There is not one independent piece of systematic evidence that shows that there are any barriers against women's advancement in the medical profession. You can't find any literature. Now, people may tell you there are, but there isn't actually any literature whatsoever. But what I'm going to show you is the sort of choices that women make, which are really quite interesting. And we've now got, I think it's over 70 specialties to choose from. So there are lots of subspecialties and women can make lots of choices. Female intake is very high, more women doctors now than there are male doctors uh, uh, in, uh, going into and uh, coming out of medical schools. Um, uh, we have a common pay scale, which is not true of a lot of professions, but we have far too few women who want to become clinical scientists who want to do the laboratory work that's related to medicine. Um, they do quite well, uh, go through medical school well, they get a PhD very well, and then when it comes to being a more senior researcher, they drop off. So people like the Medical Research Council, the Wellcome Foundation, or the Wellcome Trust would love to have more women in their senior research positions. And we have too few women who go on to reach the top positions. So it's not just do they go into the scientific part of medicine, but I also want to bring in um, the idea about uh, why they don't actually go, a lot of them, to the top of medicine. So although this is taken from a working party in 2009, uh, the college, the Royal College, it was when I... Uh, um, just up, that was after I uh, stopped being president, but I was still very involved in this research. Um, but the figures have not changed much. Um, so there are subjects in medicine that are people orientated over here and quite planable. And these are quite planable. If you want a career in pathology or radiology, when you start to come over here, you're on subjects that are less planable um, and uh, also much more technical. Now this is an interesting one because radiology is becoming um, much more technical. As, as it's advanced, um, there's much more physics in it. it it's becoming a much more um, technical subject and these of course are either unpredictable or are quite technical um, and so what women do is choose the predictable and the less technical um, as you can uh, as you can see there so they like something that's planable and one can understand why that is and is predictable so they make choices which take them out of the more technical subjects they don't go on to be clinical scientists and the thing that has really interested me, because I've spent some of my life trying to persuade them to go up the medical ladder, uh, because quite a few of my friends and I've done it, so it's quite doable. Um, and 
when they've chosen what they're going to do, uh, they can, they'll get to a consultant level or to, the, to becoming a partner in general practice, but do they want to be president of the General Medical Council or head of the BMA? We've never had a woman in either of those positions. We have very few women deans of medical schools. We have relatively few women uh, as medical directors. So again, it is quite interesting. Um, you can see there less than 25% of, of our medical directors are women and just 13% of university um, professors. So kind of what is that um, about? And this book, The Confidence Code by Katie Kay and Claire Shipman, talked about the fact that women don't feel quite so confident um, as men, they let their doubts stop them. Um, and we tend not to try um, rather than not have the ability. Um, and that book goes on at quite a lot of uh, length about that topic. Some of you in the audience will know who Mary Beard is. Mary is a fellow of my college, um, a very uh, prominent classicist, uh, now quite a media uh, personality, and she gave a very good lecture uh, recently and then wrote it up uh, um, in the London Review uh, of Books. And Mary summarized it as saying, women are perceived as being outside of power, and by various unconscious means, we cast women as interlopers when they make it to power. Um, knocking on doors, shaking the cage, smashing the glass ceiling. Um, and she described that as underlying female exteriority. I, I have to say I didn't experience that myself um, in medicine, um, but there may be many prof professions in which that is so. Just thinking about how many women get to the top in the business world, and you will know this much better uh, than I do, um, this was just taken from some insights uh, uh, from Bain and company, uh, uh, and looking at women and men when they were newly appointed or when they were experienced, thinking about their path to the top, I see myself fitting into the typical stereotypes of success within my company. Uh, well, you can see um, by the time they're experienced, um, then men are doing um, much uh, better uh, than women. S supervisors being supportive. Um, again, the men do better than the women. I have role models similar to me, senior top management. So fewer role models. They were some of the things they thought. And the Harvard Business School, which I thought was a fascinating um, study, they said this was their MBA program. And this was looking at a survey of, of their graduates on their career um, success. And they, and they followed them over many years. Um, and they said that men and women start with similar goals. Few women opted out to have children, but women prioritized their home life over their careers, and therefore it slowed down their progression. So it wasn't that they just took time off to have families, they had their families, came back, but they didn't pursue that career structure uh, as much as their men did. The men expected their careers to take precedence over the women, and the women had hoped that their careers would take precedence over their partners, um, but were disappointed. So w when you read this report, um, and not only were they less satisfied, but many of them left. They left their high-flying jobs. It wasn't that they did nothing. Many of them formed their own small companies or did things in which they had much more personal control um, and were able to develop a career, but not the career that they had originally um, wanted. And this need to provide good 
re-entry points was very well made um, in this report. And, and the British Civil Service has very, very good um, terms of service for women who want to take leave, um, maternity leave. But what I've observed from doing three reports for government is when women come back from maternity leave, they're often given rather lesser jobs. You know, well, let's come back and not give you too stressful a job. Whereas what most women would like is something to really get their teeth into. They don't want to come back to a lesser job. Um, so uh, it's more meaningful work and more challenges assignments. And of course, men play a big uh, role in life. Just one or two odd slides that I found that I thought were important to equality and diversity. I haven't read this report carefully enough, but I'm going to read it much more carefully. But I only got it uh, about three weeks ago. It's the Chartered Insurance Institute, 2016, and it's women's risks, exposure, and resilience uh, to risk. And I just picked out one or two facts which I think is of interest, I hope, to both the men and women in the room. This was on education, about what girls do at GCSE, um, which is uh, one of the exams used to be called O-Level in at home, um, and they do better uh, than the boys. 51% of women go into university, 42% of men. And women earn the same as men in this study, in their 20s, but as they get older, they're earning less. 29% of women earn below the living wage, 22% of men. And as you can see, men on average accumulate five times the pension pot of women. And, and they, they were very, it, it was a very good report that then dissected each of these things, but I thought that was quite interesting. Finally, could I get you to remember that a woman's life has quite a lot of humps in it? Men's do, but um, I've talked to you about the gender stereotyping early, the building of confidence. Young workers, whether they're male or female, can often have job insecurity, but there's maternity leave, family pressures, Harassment, sexual harassment at work is alive and well. Um, there's caring responsibility. We don't want to talk about the menopause because it's much too embarrassing, uh, but it does cause women to leave work uh, or feel so ashamed that they don't want to talk about their symptoms. Um, and we need to get over that and, and just talk about it like we talk about uh, maternity leave. So they might leave the workplace early. This is just um, a project at home, um, and it was women's experience of bullying and harassment. Um, the, the base number was 22061, 50% uh, overall uh, females. And it just gives you some idea in this particular study that, and, and this excluded sexual harassment, but 71% of women with disabilities, experienced bullying and harassment, and 61% um, of bisexual uh, women in the age of 28 to 40. So that's alive and well. Um, I won't waste time, because I'd like to discuss things, on the gig economy, but I'm very conscious that women are very much alive and well in the gig economy, uh, often in secure work often doing two or three jobs to make up a living wage, and many of them may be single parents and the breadwinner. So I think the gig economy is something um, that women um, participate in. Caring in, in the UK is primarily done by women. Men do participate, but um, uh, uh, women um, uh, more and then the menopause which I've mentioned um, and we need to think about doing something about that. So I've taken you through a very rapid uh, uh, count through some things about equality um, and diversity but 
knowing where the background of many of you, I'm really interested in your observations on what we do to get more women into STEM and keep them there. We are getting better at getting women into engineering, but if it's civil engineering, they leave quite soon. So there's, there's lots of things that I think we don't understand well, and we really need uh, men to help us understand them um, more. And we certainly need um, uh, to get more women uh, into the science subjects. And I think we're very much on a journey. I don't think this is a completed journey, but I think we're, we're getting there. So I'm going to stop there, but I really, uh, I'd really love to hear your experience of what happens in Singapore or in Asia or any observations you have which might help um, the work we're, we're trying to do um, in Cambridge. I sit on the university's equality and diversity board, uh, so as I say, we face quite a lot of challenges. <laughs>